However, I would like to observe protocol this morning and welcome His Excellency, the Governor, Reynold Kronovelt, President of Parliament, the Honorable Sarah Westcott Williams, Prime Minister, the Honorable Richard Gibson, Sr., Third Vice President of the Territorial Council of French St. Martin, Mr. Wendell Cox, Secretary General of the Office of the Ombudsman, Mr. Randolph Duggins, Secretary General of the Audit Chamber, Mrs. Joan duvalet mate Honorable Members of Parliament, Honorable Members of the Council of Ministers, Secretary General of the, General of the Ministry of General Affairs, Hensley Plantain, Chief Commissioner of St. Martin, Police Commissioner Carl John, Commander of the Vic IS St. Martin, Mr. Tony Rogers, Members of the Media, Ladies and Gentlemen, Good morning. I'm Cedric Peterson from the Department of Communication under the Ministry of General Affairs and on behalf of the government of St. Martin, I welcome each and every one of you to the National Remembrance Day wreath laying ceremony where we, re where we remember the victims who have fought during the Second World War, a global war that started in 1939 and ended in 1945. It has been described as the most widespread war in history where more than 100 million people served their countries in military groups and where tens of millions of their lives were taken, making it the deadliest conflict in human history. To begin our ceremony this morning, we had previously scheduled to have a member of the Christian Council join us for the opening address this morning, but unfortunately he was unable to attend. So we'll be going forward So at this time, I would like to welcome Reverend Father Terence Rawlings of the Christian Council, who will deliver the National Remembrance Day Address for 2016. We remember today those who have laid down their lives for our freedom, a cause in which they so passionately believed. We pray that they have found peace with God, and we resolve that their sacrifices will always be remembered by this grateful country. It is almost a century since the end of the First World War, but the sad truth is the war is still with us. Remembrance Day, therefore, cannot just be an occasion for collective nostalgia and glory. Certainly, yes, it does provide opportunities for those among us with cherished memories of loved ones who served to come together with others, to remember, and to honor them. And for those enough fortunate to have escaped all the evils of war, to stand with them in solidarity. And although it is good to remember, there has to be more. We all claim to want peace, but if we keep coming back year after year only to remember and do nothing else, then how can we say that we're working towards that goal? Remembering in the abstract loses its value unless we can see it as an opportunity for learning, for healing, as an opportunity to change things for the good of all. We're called to reflect upon how we respond as people of faith in a world of terrorists, of wars and rumors of wars. We cannot and ought not avoid wrestling with the serious issues of our time. How can we, in the midst of difficult times, not give in to fear or despair, but extend God's message of love and reconciliation to the world? Fortunately, we can learn through God's inspiring word the appropriate response. It provides us with a firm basis for individual action for good against all evils. And all God asks of us is that we choose to love. He has showed us how to love by sending us his son, Jesus Christ. He who lived during a period of conflict and occupation as we know, and yet during his time on earth, he taught us to turn the other cheek in the face of adversity. He became, he came in order to tell us what his father expected of us. 
He was the foundation of all Christian moral teaching. And from him we receive our Christian values such as faith, hope, and love. It is as Christians, therefore, that we must first move forward and defend the ethical stance, that which is pleasing to God, such as justice, tolerance, and respect for human rights over the political, ethnic, and economic issues that are often reasons for conflict. It is as Christians that we must act to achieve peace. True peace can never be achieved alone. It is never easy. It is never cheap. It is hard work. And it establishes and to keep peace at any level in the society. Yet regardless of the difficulties, peace must be what we all strive for, what the prophets foresaw, and what Christ himself has taught us. The driving force for peace must come from us. It must come from our remembrance of those who have given their lives in war. It must come from those injured in conflict and for their families and loved ones. Peace will not come if we forget. It will not happen if we wait for others to work for it. It is through our vigilance, our voice, and our prayers that peace will emerge. So today, we especially honor the memory of all those who served their country in war and conflict and have died. They deserve to be remembered, but they deserve more than just being thought of on one day each year. These fallen soldiers listed here deserve the optimism of their hopes to become reality so that indeed one day there will be no more war and we can honestly claim to be civilized countries. What a tribute that would be to them. In a moment, we shall pause in silence. Let us use that time not to count the seconds but to honor the memory of our loved ones by considering what each of us might do to further the cause of peace with justice and forgiveness on whatever scale possible. What is most assuring is that God is at work in the world, even when we cannot see or understand. In Hebrews, we're told that faith is being sure of what we hope for, and certain of what we do not see. We can be sure of God's character. He who says, and we are certain of his promises, he who will do what he says. As we remember the sacrifice of the many who died, let, us, let not the enduring tragedy of lost lives and the experiences and traumas of those who survived being vain. We need to build relationships of peace and justice in our world, starting right here, right now, in this community. And for that, we will always need God's help to change each and every one of us into people who have a passion for peace and justice and a care and love for everyone. To follow our Lord's example, let us now love God and love our neighbors as ourselves. Amen. Let us pray. Compassionate God and Father of all, we are horrified at violence in so many parts of our world. It seems that none are safe and many are terrified. Hold back the hands that maim and kill. Turn around the hearts that hate. Grant instead your spirit of peace, peace that passes our understanding. Gracious God, we pray also for peace in our own communities this day. We commit to you all who work for peace and an end to tensions, and those who work to uphold law and justice. We pray for an end to fear, for comfort and support to those who suffer, for calm in our streets, 
that people may go about their lives in safety and peace. May we put our trust in the power of good to overcome evil and the power of love to overcome hatred. We pray for the vision to see and the faith to believe in a world emancipated from violence. A new world where fear shall, be no, longer, which shall no longer lead men to commit injustice nor selfishness make them bring sufferings on others. In your mercy, hear our prayers now and forevermore. Amen. For the opening address this morning, we will now have the official laying of the wreaths, and I invite His Excellency Governor Kronvald, President of Parliament, the Honorable Sir Westcott Williams, and Prime Minister, the Honorable Richard Gibson Sr., and for the first time in our observance of National Remembrance Day, we'll be joining our brothers from the north and asking the third vice president representing the French Territorial Council to engage in the wreath laying and flower laying process. So at this time, I ask everyone to please step forward. His Excellency Governor Fronneveld, I invite you at this time to lay the first wreath. President of Parliament, the Honorable Sir Westcott Williams, I request that you please do the laying of the second wreath. Prime Minister, the Honorable Richard Gibson Sr., I now request that you do the laying of the third wreath. Territorial Council of Friends at Martin, Mr. Wendell Cox, I invite you to lay the flowers. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain still as we will now have the trumpeter play the last post. Immediately following, we will observe two minutes of silence. <laughs> 